Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest on today's episode is David Marwell. He is the author of a new book called Mengala, Unmasking the Angel of Death. And it's really the story of not only this person who has become so identified as one of the monsters of the Holocaust, uh, but the story of the investigation by a team of historians a team that David himself participated in and was, was an important part of when he worked in the Department of Justice as a historian for the, uh, for the Office of the Special Investigation. So this is a story about uh, one of the notor- most notorious figures of the Holocaust. It's also a story about science and the development of medical research and the perversion of, of medical re- research. Uh, and... Uh, the story of the hunt for this individual and how it was ultimately confirmed that they had found Joseph Mengele. So a really incredible uh, story, fascinating conversation with David. I know you will enjoy everybody. Please continue to be safe and well and enjoy this next episode of Good Law, Bad Law. Thirty-five years ago, as a young reporter in Washington, D.C., the very first article I was assigned to write about was a then little-known office in the Department of Justice called the Office of Special Investigations. And at that time, uh, Patrick Buchanan, who was President Reagan's communications director, was railing against the OSI for uh, turning to Soviet documents to help it with its investigations. And now, all these years later, it's really my honor to welcome as a guest on the program somebody who worked in that Department of Justice office and the author of a new book called Mengele, Unmasking the Angel of Death. So we'll talk about that little intro in a second, David. But first of all, uh, thank you so much and welcome to Good Law, Bad Law. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I don't know if you remember that episode uh, where Pat Buchanan was trying to make a, a, a little bit of news, but I'm pretty sure you were you were there at the OSI in those days, right? Yeah, yeah I remember it very well. <laughs> I didn't get very far with that, I know. Um, right. Well, you know, there was this famous uh, debate on uh, Crossfire between Eli Rosenbaum yeah. and Patrick Buchanan. I, I'm not sure it was then or, or later, but... Uh, I think it was a bit later on, past that. But but it, uh, yeah, it a, those were those were the days. Yeah, those were the days. And of course, uh, what a fascinating uh, department in the uh, in the Justice Department. Such an unusual, uh, extraordinary assignment. Uh, to to and and what a incredible experience it must have been for you to to work on that. And I know. What led you to write this book on Mengele is the work that you did uh, those many years ago uh, when you were, in effect, hunting for uh, what turned out to be the remains of uh, Joseph Mengele. Um, Maybe you could give a little background on yourself, first of all, and then I'd like to talk about some of the background uh, of this person who has become one of the... uh, archetypes of the of the killing machine that the the Nazi government became um, and uh, but but maybe maybe there's some interesting twists to that and you certainly talk about that in the book and then I'd really like to hear more about some of the work that you did in the investigation into uh, finding tracking down Megala because I, I think that's such a great uh, part of the story that you're telling in the book but but start if you would start and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, so uh, thanks for asking me to do that. I I love to talk about those days because it was uh, for me such a privilege uh, to be involved with the office of special investigations. I joined the office 
as a young uh, graduate student, what we call ABD. I, I completed all my graduate work except for my dissertation, and I joined as the third historian in the office. Interestingly, um, the the office was outfitted at the beginning as any kind of traditional prosecutor's office would be, with criminal investigators who were detailed from other federal agencies uh, to to join the the, the brand new office, uh, which was established in 1979. And um, it soon became clear, however, that that this was not these were not normal federal prosecutions, and um, the investigations required work in uh, foreign languages and in, in a history that was nearly forgotten uh, by by uh, all involved except except those who actually uh, lived it and, and historians who studied it. So uh, the the organizational chart of the office changed. Uh, the the people brought in as history graduate students were brought in to translate documents and to assist in the investigation, but pretty soon it became clear that, that the historians would become the investigators in the office. So that, I joined as a third, yeah. Yeah, please. well, and, and that in itself is so fascinating. It says a lot about what these special investigations were. These were, I mean, the, the office was created, right, to particularly focus on uh, hunting Nazis who had illegally entered the United States and were living yeah. Among us, I mean, there's a, I don't know how popular it really is anymore, but there's an Amazon uh, original series called uh, right. called Hunters or Nazi Hunters, I forget now, yeah. uh, with Al Pacino. Yeah. And, and yet yeah. here was this actual office doing these investigations to root out these, uh, these former war criminals. Right. You know, at that time, it was really little known that, that, Many, many people who were involved in the persecution of innocent victims uh, were able to kind of melt into the sea of, of displaced persons after the war and found their way to the United States, sometimes on the same ships as, as the people whom they persecuted, and built new lives here. Um, these were not the, the people that perhaps uh, the, the, you would conjure up as Nazi war criminals. These were not, for the most part, Germans. They were auxiliaries, people who were uh, recruited by the Nazis to assist them in the occupation of the Soviet Union. Um, and they were translators, they were uh, auxiliary policemen, they were uh, camp guards, but yep. mostly relatively low level. Um, and, you know, there, there's an estimate, I, this was, a, I think, a, a complete guess by, by the former director of the office, uh, Alan Ryan, who said there were perhaps 10,000. Now, that may maybe the right number, it may be, may be a few, an overestimation or, or in fact more likely probably an underestimation. Yeah. Well, and that, and that in itself is, is, an, is an important part of the history that I, I think probably a lot of people don't realize, which because we associate, um, you know, World War II, the Nazi regime, the Hulk, the carrying out of the crimes of the Holocaust as being at the hands of these few monstrous you know, almost caric caricatures of monsters, uh, you know, from Hitler through, you know, the top ranks, Eichmann and, and, and a few others. But, but really, the, those who were necessary to carry out the enormity of these crimes, it, it had to involve a lot of people. What did you say? Guards yes, I mean, and uh, member of the SS the shooting squads and, and so on. The Germans could not have carried out their their uh, their um, genocidal plans in 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 the territories they occupied without the assistance of locals um, who knew the language who who knew who the Jews and the communists were and who linked their stars to the to the new occupiers and these people were very difficult to root out after the war because they were in fact displaced people they they couldn't go home because uh, they would have been Facing Soviet justice, and they 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 had to go along with their victims to Germany and, and took up residence in DP camps and ended up um, coming to the United States and to England and Canada and Australia and, and other places, and some actually to South America. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So, and it's another important thing to, to realize is that uh, given the uh, legal challenges at the time, um, we didn't uh, investigate and prosecute these individuals for the actual crimes they committed. Uh, although there's a theoretical jurisdiction that could be claimed, um, it was not, I think, practical. And uh, we instead prosecuted them for having misrepresented their past when they applied for uh, immigration and then citizenship in the United States. So it was, these were really immigration fraud cases that were uh, mm -hmm. carried out in, in immigration court if, the, if it was a case of, of, um, of uh, immigration violations or uh, in federal court if, if they had become citizens. Or right. So, so if you were successful in a case, the result was not putting someone in prison here for war crimes. It was deporting them to some place. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and and for, for many, this seems a tremendous imbalance, you know, the, the, the enormity of the crime and what one might consider to be uh, a relatively lukewarm sanction. However, one shouldn't underestimate or trivialize uh, the, 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 the cost to a person of being uh, uh, denaturalized and deported, usually at an advanced age. Um, and after all, it was it was the only thing that we could do. So uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of the, the, the legal context. So um, it's not, it's obviously not what one might consider ideal justice, but there was a, a, a form of justice that was long overdue and, and important to carry out. Well, I want, I want to ask you about that actually, uh, before we get into the story of, of Joseph Mengel himself. Yeah. Be, uh, as, as I may have mentioned, my last journalism project before I went to law school was a book on this very topic. I wrote about right. uh, a guy named Joseph Schwamberger, who, like like Mengele, as we'll hear, uh, found his way through the sea of people on the move at the end of the war and found his way to Argentina uh, before he was sent uh, back to Germany <clears throat> and was tried and convicted there and spent the rest of his days in prison. And right. I, I really wrestled with this question of what is justice when the crimes we're talking about are so enormous and uh, so much time has passed and every year makes it, uh, passing of every year makes it more and more difficult to uh, bring a case because witnesses are dying and wit evidence is growing, you know, more cold and all. Uh, but, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I, I really thought was so important about the effort and the exercise, uh, whether you start with the trial of the major Nazi figures in Nuremberg on through to uh, the trial of Joseph Schwamberger in the, in the late 80s to the work that OSI was doing. There, there is some kind of a justice in, in the acknowledging of uh, who these people were and not allowing that to be forgotten. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's as if in this, I'm, I'm inadequately quoting um, Alan Ryan, in, who, who said in, in a speech back then that uh, it's many people consider it some kind of balance between a person having escaped 50 years and then nothing being done to them. Um, you can't let that happen. By, you have to acknowledge and do what flex the muscles you have do what you can do to to identify the crimes identify the criminals and 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 acknowledge what was done even if it leads to um to uh, dismiss charges or 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 uh, you know often these cases were were petered out because of the the, the health of the of the individual but at least you've done what you, what you could do so I, I, I believe that that was extremely important. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Hitler not only had plans to wipe out Jews and other minorities in Europe, but to wipe out any memory of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was in his writings, in his speeches, and uh, and and really, and that, that's, an, that's, a, that's another key point that I, yeah. I think is also often overlooked. Uh, we we and and OSI. And when you mention Pat Buchanan, this is important. Uh, back then, 35, 40 years ago, was the beginning of this movement of 
uh, at least the more vocal part of the movement of Holocaust denial. Yeah. And here we were, uh, we were writing not not history books, but writing into the transcripts of trials, um, with the evidence being subject to the crucible of the of of the courtroom, with the adversarial procedure where 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 uh, witnesses were cross-examined, evidence was examined by forensic experts, and judges made decisions based on the facts and the law, and you ended up in the very transcripts of these trials, uh, a very important history that was tested and and uh, um, and steeled by by the process itself. So right. I think that's a very important uh, uh, unintended consequence of, of of what we did. Right, absolutely, and maybe intended too. I mean, you you can't yeah. have a verdict, whether in a courtroom trial or in history, without a record. I mean, you, otherwise you just leave history. And and truth itself to whatever people want to say it is. So and so you you, you, you mentioned before that the, the part of, of Buchanan's attack on us was that we were using documents from the Soviet Union. Well, yeah. that's correct. And why did we use them? It's like the uh, um, that that's where the evidence was. Right. Uh, and right. Uh, but these documents were subject to rigorous forensic examination, but by handwriting experts, by paper and ink experts um and so the fact that we went to these lengths to to prove the authenticity of of the, the records themselves and that the witnesses were cross-examined and tested i think that that says a lot as a as a kind of antidote to the to the pernicious uh, uh, movement of trying to deny that these events actually happened well and as you talk about in the book david more and more uh, archives and bodies of evidence have become available and have opened up in the yes. last 35 and 40 years. And that was really important, not only to debunk what uh, people like Buchanan were claiming, but but to help historians like you get at the raw evidence that helps tell these stories and tell the history. You know, that's, that's absolutely true. When I, I originally started to write a book Solely about the investigation, um, I, I must confess my my interest in Mengele himself was. Uh, I mean, I certainly had an interest in, in the man, but I thought, I believed when I started the book that there was very little I would be able to find out about about uh, about the man himself. And little did I know that when I started reading the stuff I hadn't been reading in the last thirty years since I'd worked on the case, um, I ended up discovering a huge amount of new material, new new scholarship by brilliant historians, and new records that had become uh, available from Israel to the declassified records of the, the CIA, uh, the Mossad, and um, and even some of Mengele's own uh, writings that, that had uh, become available. So um, history, in 1985, when I worked on the case, uh, the, what was available to us to understand Mengele was just paled in, com in comparison to what what I found when I started writing in 2016. Well, t tell I mean I think everybody should know already who Joseph Mengele was, but um, yeah. tell us you know thumbnail for those who don't who he was and why uh, why he mattered and how he fit in. I mean because the weaving together of this bizarre branch of science uh, with Nazi ideology and how those forces yeah. combined uh, lethally is, uh, is, is really fascinating and important. So I should say, uh, as a, by way of background, that uh, OSI, I've, we've already discussed what the kind of uh, normal kind of case was, that is of a, of a non-German or an ethnic German auxiliary wow. campfire. Um, we got involved in the Mengele case because, uh, um, for a lot of reasons that I'll get into, but uh, Mengele was, of course, not an auxiliary. He was a SS officer who had served in the uh, one of the SS Waffen SS uh, divisions as a as a as a uh, physician, and then was assigned to the Auschwitz concentration camp, where he became. Um, Extremely famous, not only to his victims but also to 
um, to the world thanks to uh, his being elevated, if you will, and that's a bad word, but elevated to the, to the uh, to kind of represent the camp itself in the popular imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, what we know about Mengele, what most people know about Mengele is, is in essence a kind of caricature of the man he was. Um, and he became a, a, a symbol not only of, of the Holocaust itself and of, of the most notorious uh, scene uh -huh. of the crime, that is Auschwitz, but also uh, a kind of poster boy for uh, justice that didn't exist, that didn't happen. Uh, so for um, mm -hmm. yeah. failed justice, um, and so he carried uh, the, the 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 persona of Mengele carried these kind of twin um, um, symbolic uh, importance, and he became a a figure for many, many filmmakers and writers and even poets who uh, used him as um, a benchmark for evil. Uh, it, you know, I have a, um, I have a, a Google alert on my, on my phone and I get notice every day of every mention of Mengele in the, in the world press. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, Every single day. Today, I think there were eight mentions of him from all over the world. Wow. Sometimes for his role in history, usually exaggerated and, and kind of caricaturized. But more often than not, as a benchmark for evil. Now with the coronavirus, you get all of these comparisons of, of, of uh, unethical positions of you know mm -hmm. the guy this guy was the mengele of that hospital or this guy oh my God. mengele yeah. of that research um so what that the, the the more that he became this symbol the more obscure he became as a human being as a man and mm -hmm. my book attempts to strip away some of that myth that has attached itself to mengele and has served to elevate him into this iconic role and at the same time my book hopes and strives to replace what is a frightening character of a man with something that perhaps even more unsettling, and that is a picture of the human being that he was. So that's that's kind of the crux of, of what I'm trying to do in the book. Yeah, I, I've, I've thought that for a long time too, David, that if, if we only see the perpetrators of the Holocaust as these caricatures, then isn't it harder for us to relate to them and see and understand how this happened and see and understand how this or something like it could happen again? But if you, Absolutely. as you say, strip away those caricatures, um, for instance, Mengele is often, is most often identified as the one who selected people as they came off the trains, which would right. go to the gas chambers and die and which ones might live a little bit longer by being assigned to some work task, but he right. wasn't the only one who had that job. There were other others right. in that position as well, but he's the one we identify. So that's that's right. something of a character, I guess. But the more real, the more human he is, the more human you can understand him as being, he is then relatable, yes. and we should all I, feel the horror of his humanness. I think that's absolutely right. And it, it, it is difficult for some people to accept. It's much easier in some ways to relegate him to the ranks of, of, the, of, the, of the anomalous, the, 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 uh, you know, the picture of him as this, this uh, grotesque sadist who, who derived uh, some kind of pleasure from, from sadistic acts and satisfied obscure drives um, while carrying out his uh, medical work at Auschwitz, that's in some ways strangely easier to do that than to than to recognize that he was part of a much larger system, mm -hmm. um, and to kind of recognize the monstrousness of that system rather than uh, label him a monster himself. Uh, I, I haven't said that quite very well, but that's no. I that's I think it's very well. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I think yeah. that makes a whole lot of sense, and that and and that 
bigger uh, instrument that that w with without which probably uh, that you know the Nazi regime couldn't wouldn't have had the same power um, yeah. and the same dangerous power. I'm not talking necessarily about military power, but the same uh, power for doing such harm was the the ideal ideology that people like Mengele represented. Right. Uh, and so Mengele was a believer. He, he yeah. really believed in this. And you can, you can trace it back to his career. He had an elite education, although in, 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 in high school, in the gymnasium, he was a kind of middling student without demonstrating great academic promise. But when he got to the university in the spring of 1930, he decided um, that he would study uh, medicine and the allied fields of medicine at that time, um, uh, anthropology and, and racial science. And it was at this very time that that particular field of, of inquiry of, of uh, racial hygiene, um, anthropology, medicine uh, became allied with, with the politics of the Nazi state. The Nazi state relied on on uh, this uh, scientific view of race and the and the and the uh, importance of race, um, it became a kind of uh, a symbiosis with the, with the politics. And uh, the science that Mengele chose to study, out of true deep intellectual interest and passion, um, was also advantaged by the state, advantage in, the, in terms of the funding that was given to it, in terms mm -hmm. of the status that was bestowed on those who practiced it. And Mengele had, you know, he had uh, uh, several uh, Nobel laureates, either present ones at his time or ones that would become Nobel laureates. Um, he was considered to be uh, in the vanguard of this science. Um, and he did things that uh, promising young scientists do. He wrote, he wrote papers, he wrote book reviews, um, and he served his his masters well. He was uh, he got a PhD in anthropology. He got a medical degree, meaning a medical license, but also got an advanced degree in medicine, a PhD in medicine, which would kind of set him on a course for a for an academic career, uh, which is where he was headed mm -hmm. when the war began. And then, so how how did I, I mean? I think people sometimes, if you hear anthropology, they think about people hunting fossils in the desert. Right. Uh, what what I mean for people to understand when when he was pursuing anthropology, I mean, what kind of anthropology was it? How did that then tie in as he became more as it became right. more imp important for scientists to be political? Um, and then how did that tie into what what the whole Nazi state was was doing with that? Right. So his 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 branch of, of, of anthropology was really physical anthropology, which became uh, it, in the years of the Nazi period, became uh, really racial, racial science. Uh, that is that a, a person's race found expression in their in their physical appearance and in in. Uh, uh, in physical characteristics, so that he um, his his dissertation is in anthropology was to examine the lower jawbone from the collection of anthropology at the University of Munich and decide to determine whether you could, by careful measurement and comparison, determine what race the uh, person whose lower jawbone that was had mm -hmm. been. Um, this was an attempt to try to find a, a racial um, Diagnosis it was very important for Nazi ideology to be able to tell what race someone was, um, uh, and and uh, so there were all these techniques developed to to try to determine that the, the dream was that you would be able to take a drop of someone's blood and 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 do a test on it and determine uh, what race they were, what percentage of different races, the mm -hmm. admixture of different races they were. Uh, and Mengele was deeply involved in in that uh, before the war, when he worked at the institute in Frankfurt for his medicine PhD uh, mentor, a guy named Otto von Verschur, uh, 
who was um, one of the great racial racial scientists. I say great, but one of the the most prominent racial scientists right. in right. in Germany at the time. And one of the things he did as as a, an assistant to uh, to Fersure was to uh, carry out racial evaluations for the court uh, after the after the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, um, there were some criminal statutes which which uh, made it a criminal offense for a Jewish person to have sexual relations with a non-Jew. And uh, there were cases where the defendant uh, who had been charged with this criminal act uh, would, would offer the defense saying, I'm not, you've got it wrong, I'm not a Jew. I'm, I'm, my, my mother was Jewish, yes, but, but she had had an affair with someone, and I'm the product of that affair, so that my legal father is not my biological father. And then Mengele would be called in to do the evaluation to determine whether the guy was a full Jew or a half Jew. And he would do this by doing a very careful cataloging of the person's physical characteristics and, and a comparison of his characteristics with that of, of of the, so, of the putative uh, biological father. Anyway, the Nazis took this very seriously, and and Mengele was right there at the cutting edge of this of how this science was applied. Well, and and just as a side note, because I my mind is racing with with varying connections, but we we just did a podcast episode I don't know a couple of months ago on the history of uh, the first blacks in this country who. Uh, who attained freedom, and it was before the Emancipation Proclamation. And one of the ways uh, that, that those who did attain freedom uh, would would be able to do so was by going into court and exactly as you're describing taking place in Nazi Germany, make a legal argument that they weren't in fact black, that they were that was not their race. Uh, so lest anyone think that the things we're talking about here could only ever take place in right. Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, not true. Um, right. You know, so, wow. Okay, so so Mengele is really, um, maybe an, as an initial matter, just kind of this ordinary person who doesn't have any mark on him for the uh, greatness or evil greatness that he later attains, but through his career, he finds himself in this stream, you know, in this really powerful stream of ideology. Uh, and then, and, and, and that becomes really so core to, to what the Nazi, Nazi state was doing from the, even in the years before the war, as you say, the, you know the racial laws of Nuremberg, and uh, you know uh, sterilizing, uh, right. you know people who they deemed, uh, you know, would would uh, somehow infect or poison the Nazi, the German race, the Aryan race. Right. Um, and then he gets to uh, Auschwitz, where he gets full access to uh, right how these forces come together. Yes. Um, you know, uh, Himmler is said to have said that that National Socialism was simply biology, applied biology, and I think that's uh, I think that's uh, one of the keys to understanding mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 status that Mengele had and 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 the, the importance of the the, the science he, he decided to study. So he gets to he gets to Auschwitz and. If you look at this from a from a kind of organized science point of view, there's some very interesting um, conclusions to draw, um, and it's a bit complicated to to explain. But um, Mengele arrived at Auschwitz after having served for two two well a year and a half of steady and unrelenting um, combat. He was. Uh, involved with the 5th Waffen-SS Division, so-called Viking Division, from the invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941 until um, the retreat from Stalingrad uh, in in uh, January of 1943. Mm -hmm. And he's with the unit with with almost without break for that period of time. 
and that unit was involved early on in the invasion of the Soviet Union uh, in some significant atrocities in the in Ukraine. We don't know if Mengele was involved in those, but he's certainly exposed to them and, and knew about them. Uh, he's evacuated from his unit was sent to cov cover the retreat from Stalingrad. And he's flown out of there in January of 1943. He then hooks up with his he sent to Berlin to a, a reserve unit. And he hooks up with his um, his mentor, who had moved from Frankfurt to Berlin to take over the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. And he's associated with the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute from January 1943 until May, when he's transferred to Auschwitz. While at the institute, he meets and um, becomes a colleague in a way, although he wasn't assigned technically to the institute, but he spends a great deal of time there. And he's familiar with all the research that's done there. And um, Part of what they did at the institute was they were involved in, along with other institutes around Germany, involved in, they were involved in twin research. Mm -hmm. Twin research was considered the kind of gold standard of genetic research at the time. And based on um, the comparison of both identical twins and of fraternal twins, um, identical twins having um, the same genetic makeup, fraternal twins having the same makeup as siblings would have, but having the identical um, environment within the womb and then in the same nutritional and family rearing techniques. So it was, you were able then to, by comparing these sets of twins, tease out what pathology was um, genetic and what would have been caused by, by uh, environmental issues. So let's say I'm making this up, let's say schizophrenia uh, there was an 80% correlation of schizophrenia within identical twins, meaning both pairs had it 80% of the time, and in fraternal twins only 30% of the time. So you could then posit, if that's the case, that schizophrenia was was genetically influenced. And so this was a this was the basically the the way genetic research was done in in Germany at the time and, and elsewhere. The the sort the the uh, number of twins available for this research had decreased significantly with the war. Mm -hmm. um, the, usually you study children because you need the twins together and when you get older twin pairs diverge and build separate lives. So the children in German cities were sent to the countryside for their own protection um, and twin research essentially ground to a halt. Mengele gets to Auschwitz and he has almost an well, an unprecedented access to a tremendous number of of twins, mm -hmm. and so just he's because able of the sheer to number. Just because of the sheer, sheer number. number. Yes, I mean, it, tw twins uh, occur between one and a half and two percent of the population yeah. of of live births, and at Auschwitz, while Mengele was there, there's probably three quarters of a million people came. Uh, came into Auschwitz and just do the math and you figure out that there was a significant number of twins. So Mengele was, had at his disposal this tremendous source of, of subjects upon whom he could carry out the kinds of experiments that were being carried out at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and at the institute that he was involved in in Frankfurt before that. He also uh, was interested in other kinds of things that an anthropologist would be interested in. Um, growth anomalies, giantism and dwarfism. And again, with the, the scale, the number of people that, that, that came to Auschwitz, they, representatives of those growth anomalies uh, were there in larger numbers than would have been available. Uh, Mengele was interested in, in, in so-called gypsies and there were a tremendous number of gypsies in Auschwitz, an entire camp of gypsies, and they were available for him to do his anthropological examinations. And there were other examples of this, so that Mengele um, had at his disposal this tremendous source of research subjects. At the same time, he had also a tremendous source of, of um, experts who could assist him. If you think about all of the medical personnel who were deported to Auschwitz from, from all over Europe, great, great physicians, uh, pediatricians, um, uh, anthropologists, medical draftsmen, uh, nurses, uh, pathologists, 
all came onto the the ramp at Auschwitz. And when Mengele was looking for twins, he was also looking for uh, people who could assist him uh, in his research. And he established at Auschwitz the kind of Auschwitz the kind of uh, research institute patterned on the ones that he'd worked in as a as a uh, as a student. And um, it, it was incredible. And um, and he, when questioned, uh, people who knew him quoted him as saying that he believed it would have been criminal for him not to have taken advantage of all of the these resources available to him at Auschwitz. Now, for him, um, the uh, Jews didn't they, they they didn't rise to the level of of, of humans, and and so that he could have. Uh, carried out these experiments without their permission, without having violated any of, of the uh, sort of ethical uh, rules that he had been taught. Um, you know, the physicians in Nazi Germany replaced individual patient as, in terms of their focus of care. They replaced that with the, the care of the racial community. And so that your your chief responsibility was to serve the racial community and not your individual patient, and that allowed a tremendous um, amount of, of of unethical behavior because your your uh, your focus was was on something other than the patient. Right, and al almost literally the health of the people rather than the health of the person. You know, health yes. of the Aryan people, the German people. Yes, allowed right. you to go to these extremes where. And again, when we say he was experimenting and researching, I mean, this was not research and experimentation that we know today in modern science. I mean, these were oftentimes horrendous uh, experiments that uh, were, where the subjects were, you know, there was no way they were going to survive them. And it was understood and accepted right. that that would be the case, right? I mean, so the, one, of, one of the challenges in, 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 um, uh, Examining Mengele's so-called scientific work at Auschwitz is that there really are no, almost literally no records. So we don't that we don't know mm. based on documentary evidence what precisely he did. We have to rely on the testimony of some of the people who were subjected to these experiments, and they are. And it's difficult to say this, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but their testimony, by by mo by most standards, is 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 problematic because mm -hmm. it, they weren't in a position to really know what Mengele was trying to do, what the goal of the experiment was. They knew what happened to them. They knew he drew my blood. He did this. Um, they were also very often children at the time and traumatized. And, and uh, it, it, so it's difficult to really, from that testimony, to know precisely what he was doing. The, the people, the physicians and and scientists whom he had so-called recruited to assist them, these inmate positions, were in a better position to, to judge what he was doing. But they also were not uh, brought into the to the club for them to know what what the, the goal of the of the experiments were. So it's difficult to reconstruct exactly what happened. We do have some post-war testimony from from his from colleagues, and we have um, a few reports that were filed with the with the uh, the uh, body in Germany that funded some of the research, um, so we're able uh, not not me but but German historians of science who've gone through all this has, have been able to kind of isolate and talk about several areas of his research. Um, but we we don't we don't really know. I mean, a lot of people uh, explain that he was interested in twins because he was interested in in uh, the secret of multiple births. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to apply that secret into increasing the German birth rate. Well, that's not true. Uh, that was that was an assumption someone made, and it's been repeated and repeated. Um, it fails to recognize that if you were interested in twin births, you would likely look at the parents who gave birth to the right. twins and right. not, not the, the twins, twins themselves. themselves. Yeah, and also ignores the the whole tradition of twin research, which was uh, which I've already. Discussed gone into um so well so, that's so one David, example of how yeah well so given that and that's yeah. i mean that's ties back to what we were talking about earlier where um i mean though they were meticulous record keepers 
they also were good in the final months of the war at destroying documents because they knew yeah. the end was coming. So yeah. as a hist- as a research historian trying to piece this together, given the given the I mean, maybe problems is too strong a word, but given the challenges of dealing with evidence uh, in this in this kind of situation, what how, what com- what where do you get the confidence you have that uh, you can say what he what he did and and know what he did right. and the role he served there? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, I, I'm I'm relatively careful. I mean, I'm very careful in drawing. Uh, concrete conclusions about the nature of the experiment. I do, um, I, I do suggest what some of them were, and because for, for for a few of them we have we do have kind of post-war reliable information about it, and the other stuff you, you just have to make your, your best judgment based on the evidence that's that's there. Mm-hmm. there there's no question about Mengele's guilt, absolute guilt uh, of of significant cr- criminal acts. I mean the in terms of sheer number, um, his his so-called selections on the ramp at Auschwitz, uh, where where he was a party to the murder of of, of of tens and tens and tens of thousands of of people, uh, and it's something that he in fact himself ad, ad, admits, as I as I write in the book. Um, in terms of the the, and he's absolutely guilty of having. Um, uh, exploited the weakness of the subjects, and uh, as having of having also uh, violated all of the the, um, the basic um, ethical um, values that should motivate science, um, and this kind of borderless, limitless science that he practiced. Um, and for me, that's 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 one of the the current lessons one can learn from from studying Mengele is that the the ambition of the of the researcher un untamp, it's untempered by by uh, a rigid set of of ethical rules can lead to absolute disaster. And nowadays, with with the CRISPR technology, where you don't have to have a Nobel Prize or or a million bucks to set up a laboratory to to carry out um, gene editing experiments. Um, it's extremely important that 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 uh, that we that we're very careful in terms of uh, enforcing and uh, observing that, that kind of science. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have the modern system of medical ethics in research, uh, drug research, medical science generally, without what happened at, at Auschwitz almost yes. as, a, as a reference point. In right. counter- Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and there were plenty of abuses of, uh, of that kind before. Again, you don't have to go to Nazi Germany to find them. I mean, the... Um, you know the syphilis experiments and and yes. other others. Uh, you know, in many parts of the world, including this country. But but since since Mengele, it, it is as if a whole system of uh, rules and and commitment to those rules has has developed, which is is a certain legacy. Um, yeah. Talk about the talk about the investigation a little bit, David. I, I mean, we we. Yeah. Uh, we're running a little slim on time, so uh, but but okay. I think all, all what we covered is is uh, so important for people to know about this man. Um, but t- tell us a little bit about some of the highlights of the investigation from from your experience with it. So we we started out. OSI was initially assigned by the Attorney General to to look into some allegations that Mengele had somehow been used by the U.S. as an intelligence asset, the same way we had used Klaus Barbie. And and others, and so the, my initial assignment was to to try to determine where Mengele was from the from the time he left Auschwitz until um, until he went to Argentina, when he might possibly have been involved with U.S. institutions or personnel. Um, that that assignment, although it continued, also expanded into uh, 
a search for Mengele himself. We believe, everyone believed at that time he was still alive. We joined forces with the uh, Germans in, in the, uh, the, the German prosecutor in Frankfurt had an open arrest warrant for Mengele, so he had actual jurisdiction over the crime. We joined with uh, Germans and with the Israelis. And the Israelis were represented by an interagency task force, uh, but the Mossad was the kind of operational lead, although we didn't know it at the time. So we, we started looking for uh, all, and we were also joined by the U.S. Marshal Service, who were going to take the lead in the actual uh, manhunt. Um, all of that came to a to a, a dramatic shift in in uh, June of 1985, when a body was discovered in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, the 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 whole scene of the investigation shifted down there. We all, not all of us, but some of us, went to Brazil to to uh, work with the Brazilian police. Uh, the exhumation of the, the body thought to be Mengele's, um, and then began a very long and very complicated forensic investigation into determining whether Mengele was, uh, whether the body was Mengele's or not. Ironically, of course, um, uh, at that time, before DNA was, was used as a forensic tool, um, it was pretty difficult because the body was, was uh, uh, basically skeletonized remains that had been uh, buried in a wet environment and were in very bad shape. Um, and so the combined forensic talent of the, of the three and now four, including Brazil, uh, came to a conclusion in the end of June that the body was likely that of Mengele. Um, but when we returned, when my colleagues and I returned to the, to the States, we went to our boss, Neil Schur, and said, look, Neil, we think the body's probably Mengele's, but this insufficient evidence and investigation has been done. We believe we should continue and try to buckle this down and find x-rays or some kind of medical information that will help us come to a, a more definite conclusion. And so then we, on our, on our U.S. taking the lead, we went back and were able to examine all the evidence that was left behind uh, by Mengele in, in Brazil. Uh, diaries, an autobiographical novel that he had written about his life, um, and a bunch of other material. And very carefully over the next uh, year or two, we were able then to to uh, lead the the discovery of of dental X-rays and other uh, evidence that at least convinced me that the body was Mengele's. Uh, the Israelis refused to accept the conclusion. They kept the case open. Uh, until DNA uh, was brought online as a forensic tool, and there was some some improvements in DNA technology. So the science that Mengele studied and dreamt about, um, and hmm. that was the recipient of his passion and and uh, whatever modest talent he had in it, uh, ended up in the end uh, that science developed to the point where we were able to find uh, a kind of absolute conclusion that the body was his. Incredible. Um, wow. And I say in the book as well, which is an, another great irony, I mean, science is kind of center stage in, in the book. Uh, the, the science that Mengele studied developed well beyond his ability to influence it. Um, in you know, 1953, the, the DNA structure is discovered, and at some point, um, the, the genome is, is mapped. Mm -hmm. And it revealed a completely different picture than, than the Nazis believed. Uh, Nazis believed that if you could determine a person's race, you, would, you could determine a tremendous amount about them. And it turns out that because the human family has been on Earth for a relatively short time, that uh, it hasn't really uh, differentiated so much. So that the, the differences between uh, so-called racial groups are actually less uh, are, are smaller than the differences within so-called racial groups. Um, this is a conclusion that would have completely shattered Mengele at, at, had he lived to uh, to learn it. And it's a great, um, you know, the, the fact that he had spent his life devoted to this science um, and that it had developed to the point which made bankrupt everything that he had believed in. Oh, my God. That is the perfect 
that is the perfect ending to a, to a really incredible, fascinating uh, conversation, David. And uh, I mentioned too, I, I have the book, and I'm, I'm about halfway through it, and it's really, really fantastic. Uh, uh, we will put a link to the book so people can get a copy of it. It's uh, okay. just out recently. Again, uh, Mengele Unmasking the Angel of Death by David Marwell. I didn't mention this before, David, but you're also the former director of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City, a great museum in New York. Yeah. Uh, hopefully our museums will open up again soon so people can uh, can go back. Um, and uh, everybody should pick up a copy of the book. Fantastic conversation. Uh, I learned a lot. And I thought I knew a lot on this, but I've learned a lot. Uh, so thank you so much, David, uh, for being on the Thank you, Aaron. It was great to have you.